All right, hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome back to another episode, a special episode of Dr. Move. That's right. Uh, this is this is very, very special. This has been a long time coming. This is one of those bucket list episodes because uh, my guest today is somebody that I've been trying for, I don't know, probably 10 years <laughs> for us to be able to do something together. And it's the great one. It's, it's, it's Dave Z from Exploding Heads Podcast, Hara Aficiando. He, he just gave me a little view of his room that he's sitting in here, and it's basically a, a VHS uh, palooza, VHS palooza. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so this guy knows his stuff dave brother what's happening man oh ricky i can't tell you how, how happy i am and how excited i am about this because it's just like you said it is like 10 years in the make it's 2023 yeah. now i've been podcasting since 2013 i've been listening to your stuff you've listened to my stuff and we've been in, in the same circles all this time having conversations and everything else and we always say yeah we got to do something we got to get together and we keep saying it <laughs> and finally finally <laughs> you said all right enough here i'm That's doing right. the thing pick a pick any movie you want we'll come on we'll talk it's not going to be a long recording i said brother I go, i'm sold i get to work with ricky finally <laughs> and i get to pick the movie and it's yeah. and it's a short a sit down conversation awesome uh, so yeah. i tell you i'm so happy ricky you're one of my favorite podcasters, and you're one of my favorite people in the community. And I'm Aww. just going to say that. And people listening, probably most of them agree. So yeah. I just had to say that. So thank it's, you. It's the competition of, of who's got the highest voice on this show. So <laughs> 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 all you folks listening, you may get confused on who's who here. So uh, I've, got, I've got the Southern draw. <laughs> That's how you tell the difference. I guess I'm Pesci. You know, <laughs> there, there you go. You got that for me. And speaking of Pesci, did you know that he – he was the one who discovered Kathy Moriarty from Neighbors. When he really? saw her in a contest, um, she was a, a swimsuit contest, something that had to do with looks or something like that. And he saw her and approached her and, and said, hey, how would you like to audition? Because, you know, she was in uh, the Jake Lamont Raging Bull with, with right. him and De Niro. And right. that's, that's how he – he happened to be someplace where she was. And, and saw her, and that's how she got introduced to, to the film industry. And I just happened to learn this an hour ago. That's why I blurted out with it. I was looking at IMDb well, trivia. I knew she was. was. I knew she was in Raging Bull, but finding out, you know, all those. I mean, again, that's that, that's why I got Dave on the show, right? Because uh, again, and I'll tell you, folks. Early on, I was like, finally, we're going to get to do this. He's going to pick a movie, and I was like, all right, I wonder which uh, horror series he's going to pull from. I wonder which, uh, like underlying horror film we haven't talked about and he threw threw me a total curveball which i love <laughs> by bringing in neighbors from 1981 with john belushi and dan Aykroyd, and i was like wow what an interesting <laughs> choice and it doesn't surprise me i mean if you if you you can't see what i'm seeing well i don't know you may see this on youtube i don't know but on his back wall you got the burning you got texas chainsaw you got I can't tell what that one is above your head Who's there. That? Creep show, maybe? Creep, you know, creep show and uh, my bloody Who Valentine. Knows? So, I mean, over. he's again, horror aficionado. And I was like, wow, okay. But I totally get it, too. And uh, we wanted to save this for the conversation because I, I think we both have a lot to talk about this movie. You were saying you've seen this probably a hundred times, you said? I probably – I here's the thing. Now, I knew I was, it was going to be a curveball with it not being a horror movie, but I also know that you talk about all movies, especially from you know the 80s and the, the older era. So, yeah. so I'm like, this will fit in. But here I am thinking. I'm like, okay, I didn't know what I was going to come up with, but the other day, maybe for like the last two or three weeks, because I'm such a big fan of this movie and I've been watching it since it came out in the 80s with my family, uh, it's – it's and it's one thing. It's a movie that I can quote all the time with my brother and my father, <laughs> and it, it just tons. There's so many lines in it, but I've watched it so many times. And what happened is just recently, I it, it, I don't know how I even got. St I th I think literally I think I, I wanted to remember one line from the movie, and I wanted it to be the exact. I, I want. I, I'm pretty sure I know the movie word for word, but there was one part towards the end when he says something about um, Elaine, his daughter's girlfriend, his daughter's boyfriend and he says he says dick is off limits talking about this guy that invited her somewhere and i didn't know if he said dick is out of the question or dick is off limits so solely because of this about three weeks ago that thought popped in my head and i 
at any time can text a line from neighbors to my brother and he'll know what I'm doing. So I just, this was a zinger. No one's ever brought this one up. And I just, I don't know why I thought of that, but Dick was off limits was something I wanted to text to my brother for <laughs> just for fun. And I, I go, I want to make sure I got the line right. So I went on, <laughs> I went on my streaming service and it, it had neighbors and I knew I could just fast forward. Now I own it and everything down here on blue and DVD, and what, but I'm lazy and it was upstairs and my movies are down here. So I wanted to see that line and make sure. So I fast forwarded a bit. I got to that line, watched the movie, finished the movie. My father was coming over the next day. My father visits on Sunday mornings. He'll come over for a cup of coffee. He'll hang out for an hour. He's seen this movie hundreds of times. Well, not hundreds, but a lot of times. <laughs> and I said, you know, while he's over, I'll, because I'm watching it, I'll, I'll finish the movie with him because I just stopped for that line and watched like five, ten minutes of it. And then I watched it with him. And then after he left, I watched the movie again, and then I started watching it again. I, I just been like 20 minute intervals here and there. <laughs> and since you said pick a movie, and I'm trying to think, okay, what horror movie do I want to talk about? And I was like, you know what? Neighbors is my favorite comedy in, in my top 10 favorite movies, period. Wow. And I've never talked about it on any podcast. And how many opportunities awesome. am I going to get to? So I was like, you know what? Th this is it. Perfect. Now let's talk about it. Yeah, perfect. man. Yeah, yeah. The stars aligned. <laughs> yeah, it was perfect. Because I was like, you know, not that I don't love talking horror, but I've talked so much of it and there's so many movies I could bring and everything. And, and, you, and you're a jack of all trades. So I'm like, well, I have a feeling that Ricky has seen this movie at least. Oh, yeah. How, how well he knows it, I don't know. But I will tell you this. This movie, along with maybe two or three others, can be I could it could be quoted anytime with me and my brother and my father, awesome. and we're gonna know. And another movie that that falls into the same category. And I I don't know if I've told you this exactly, but with the Hail Ming and all that, yeah. I know I've told you that I have a passion for the Flash Gordon movie. Well, sure. that's another one. I could text right now. I I could text right now. Have you ever seen such response to my brother? <laughs> and he'll say, well, he'll text me back. <laughs> no, truly. You know, this is how right. my family operates. So, I, awesome. it, yeah, like Flash Gordon, Neighbors is another one that we could just do lines from. We're, there's so many great lines that are, that are slept on. But oh, yeah. yeah, whatever. It's it, these movies aren't for everybody. But well, and I figured you'd you said, like this. It's figured that you said slept on because this really is a sleeper. I, I oh, really think it? this movie was about 15 years ahead of its time. Yeah, I think if it would have came out mid to late 90s to the 2000s it'd be a much bigger movie people just didn't know how to handle it and there's a lot of reasons why and we'll talk about some of that but i saw this when it came out in the theater back in the day my dad took me to go see this wow because you know we were you know we loved the blues brothers we loved yeah. you know john Belushi. i mean so and i remember us leaving my dad going i don't know what i think about this you know <laughs> And it's because you got the reversal of the characters, right? Yep. So originally they were supposed to be switched. Well, I guess with John Belushi being so coked out of his mind, they just come up with this great idea. I'll tell you what, I'll play the straight guy. <laughs> right, man. <laughs> exactly. Which, you know, it does throw you at first, but in hindsight, if you don't know, if somebody knew that didn't know John Belushi and saw this movie, it works perfectly. Yeah. It does. And uh, I don't know, to me, you can put this, and I'm not trying to compare it. Don't get me wrong. But the same way that the cable guy kind of has a following and stuff, because it's such an oddball movie, I think this kind of fits in that. It's it's a weird, dark humor uh, place right there that this just kind of fits in that was, again, way ahead of its time. And uh, for, for you that don't know, 1981, uh, <laughs> Neighbors, uh, I'll give you a quick synopsis while we're here, but a, qu a quiet – Man's peaceful suburban lifestyle is threatened by the new obnoxious couple that moves in next door. It's really all you need to know. The rest of it will fill in the blanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's pretty simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, my wife, I, just before we did this, I, I told her, she said, what are y'all going to cover? I said, neighbor. She was like, what's that? So she had never seen it. So I was showing her clips and she was like, this is strange. She said, That's Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It, it was so against type, and this, I believe, had to do with Belushi. Belushi was trying to shed his his former characters like the, the Blutarski and Animal House and right. uh, all the SNL gigs, and he wanted to be 
considered a more serious actor and he was just getting sober and he actually did right before this movie he did continental divide right which was him taking on a more serious role and he did that one and he was sober throughout it so that right. was great now the thing is after that wrapped uh they got together and they came here him and Aykroyd, and he, I guess, just Aykroyd just wanted to make him happy, and he's like, "Okay, you want to play the straight man this time again? This, let's flip it up." So, so they did that. I guess the set was a mess. There was a lot of arguing between. This is the sad part, honestly, is that yeah. Belushi ended up hating the movie. Didn't like the score. Didn't like the director. Didn't like the way it, uh, the the music choices that were used, and all this other stuff. And the, the problem is this: poor poor guy passed away yeah. because a couple of months after there was was released, right? Yes. Well, on this set, he was sober coming into it. He did Continental Divide. He was yeah. sober. He had wrote a novel. A part of me. He had wrote a script or a screenplay for um, when he was at Martha's Vineyards, uh, getting dry and everything else, and something was going. On, and he wrote a serious type thing, and he wanted to uh, write it and, and star in it. And he was trying to sell it after Continental Divide, and nobody was going for it. And then uh, Neighbors comes around. He gets on the set here, and he's still sober. And apparently. The crew, and this is 19, you know, they're filming in 1980, 1979, right. maybe. There was a lot of cocaine flying around on the set. and It was oh, yeah. a different type of, of world back then, and everything's going on. And every time there were night shoots, there would be people around, and they see this big star, John Belushi, and they know he likes to party. And, you know, you they're go. trying to do lines with Belushi. He ends up getting messed up again d during the filming of this. And I basic, basically, they say that the daytime scenes are fine. Of course, we don't always know what's daytime when they're inside the house. <laughs> right. But all the nighttime stuff, apparently, you know, he was coked out or, or, or whatever else. And it's, it's really sad that this happened because then he passes away with anger and, and resentment towards the movie. And he never gets to see yeah. the way it's appreciated by people now. Like you said, it's got this call following – like the cable guy, which is another, right. it's similar. It's right. See, I discover this is my type of comedy where sure. somebody's being harassed for no reason by somebody else <laughs> and you're, and you're seeing it. And it even spills over into horror movies sometimes. Sure. Absolutely. Right. And, and you see that. And honestly, if this movie were made now, 2023, this movie could have played out exactly as it was, but in, but in the climax, Earl kills his family, right. maybe kills everybody and runs off and it would be a horror movie. Yeah. Cause yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the set the setup is there, right? Being pushed too yeah. far, crossing that line, and you just snap, right? And and we've we've kind of gone to where that's that's where this goes. And that's the thing about this movie when you're watching it, you don't know how far it's gonna go. And I think that's the beauty of it. And uh, uh, quickly just run through the cast. Of course, we got John Belushi, we got Dan Aykroyd. We know that. Directed by uh, John Avidson, uh, who did Rocky. So it kind of yeah. shows you what we're dealing with here, which was he a good fit? I don't know. I mean, if, if you really love the movie, then you think yes. But apparently to John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, he wasn't the right guy. He didn't understand the humor. You got the problems. With Kathy Moriarty, like we talked about. Catherine Walker, who plays uh, Enid, is great. Yeah. Uh, sure. But the guy that, that steals the show for me, <laughs> Tim Zaskarinsky, man. He steals <laughs> he great. it. He's the best in this movie. If you don't know who we're talking about, I'm talking about the Sweet Chuck from the, the Police Academy movies. Right. He plays a guy that owns a little uh, auto shop or a tow truck service. He kills it in this movie. <laughs> he is fantastic. He is. Uh, yeah. If I didn't have to do this crap for a living, I wouldn't sell you my snot. <laughs> I wouldn't sell you my snot. <laughs> <laughs> He's great. He comes to his house. Think about it. He waits outside Belushi's house. And we know it's after 2 a.m. because he tried to go to bed. And then, then he goes outside, and it's probably between 2 and 3 a.m. This guy comes back to his house, and he's waiting there on his porch. And he comes out, and he goes, that's a real nice joke you played out. And then he punches him in the gut. <laughs> punches him right in the gut and walks off. <laughs> so funny, man. Just the yeah. things that happen in this movie – it's just it's not your typical comedy, but it's it's almost like the thing where it gets appreciated years later. And it's like like you said, it, it, it's ahead of its time yeah. for 1981, yeah. especially with this crew, Eckroyd and Belushi coming off the Blues Brothers and everything else they've done. It was a real oddball choice. But, you know, a lot of times back then when people took chances like that, it, it usually flopped. It, right. it, people didn't want anything different. Nowadays. Uh, I think that, you know, moviegoers and, and you know, fans, fans of film look at things like that as 
a good opportunity to to show to showcase your other talents and to do it and take a left turn and let's see what 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 else we can do and you'll see right. in more modern film it's not balked at where back then it absolutely would have been because right. it, film has just come a long way it's just different now there's so much out there and back then these are SNL uh you know alumni these are part of the the original not for you know not for what what is it prime time not, players yeah yeah prime time players and it's like this is not a normal choice for something like right. this. Right. But but their I, whole that whole experiment was always creating characters. I mean, no matter how bizarre. So I, I think you're right. I think this is both of them trying to stretch their abilities from what is expected, right? Because yeah. again, we know John Belushi is the crazy character, right? And Dan Aykroyd's always been the more stiff guy, the stiff collared guy. And uh, you know, obviously as the movies went on, especially with Dan Aykroyd, you can tell that he was constantly trying to expand who he was, right? Every once in a while, he'd slip back into, you know, the straight-laced guy, almost like uh, spies like us, right? Let Chevy Chase do all the crazy stuff. I'm the straight yeah. guy. So, but for overall, you think about nothing but trouble. All these other flicks he did that were just so left field. Dr. Detroit. Dr. Detroit, which well, <laughs> I will be doing on this show. <laughs> awesome. I love that one, too. It's oh, a yeah. big, big one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one more person I wanted to bring up. This is the tie-in, right? Lauren Marie Taylor, right? Yeah, yeah. From, also known as as Vicky from Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. Another Friday one of the Thirteenth Part Two. Very favorite movies. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So I I thought well okay, that that may be a talking point for us because we're both fond of Part Two. I know that. Oh boy, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And here's the funny thing: all the years I watched Neighbors, I'm going back to the '80s and in the '90s and the 2000s, and all the times I've watched Friday Two. I didn't make the connection that that was her until yeah. sometime in like the 2010s. I don't know why. Uh, it's only a year later. She doesn't look radically different. I, I don't. I can't explain why I didn't like right away say, "Hey, that's Vicky from Part Two. Right. I just never did. Yeah. Well, but I mean, one day I did. But you got to remember, she's she's just kind of in and out of this movie. She's not in it a whole lot. Just just pieces right. here and there. So she's almost not. A focal point, right? You need her for a couple of the jokes. Right. And you get the turnaround of, oh, hey, I've been cleared. Somebody else admitted it, and you know, I didn't <laughs> do it, and I'm going back to college. I mean, so she's just in and out. Yeah. So right. you really don't focus on her a lot. It's just the fact of it adds more to the chaos that's happening, right? Yes. So, so that may be why, you know, but this is what's the same year, right? That they that she was in both of these? Yeah, yeah. I think 1981. So. Yeah, 100 yeah. percent Yeah, yeah. isn't that so wild? And this came out in December. The end of the year, and I'm going to say Friday, came out in the summertime. Yeah. So I guess it's possible that I'm going to find – I'd like to know which one was shot first because, like I said, she doesn't look radically different, but she looks – she doesn't look the same as she does on the set right. of Friday too. the way she looks in there. It, sure. it doesn't look the same. Her hair longer, I guess, in Friday too, and something. So – but then again, maybe it's pinned back, and I'm not – it's just weird though. Yeah, but yeah. I'm curious to know when they, when they shot them because – you know, especially loving these two movies, they're easily both in my top twenty of all movies. Not That's horror awesome. movies, not comedy. <laughs> Friday Two and Neighbors, no yeah. question, are in my yeah. top twenty of all I, films. I've, I've <laughs> always thought Friday Two just was was way more gritty and rougher than pretty much any of the other flicks. Oh yeah. yeah. So. That's, I don't know if that's the reason that I like it so much, but but there's lots is. to like about it. The look yes. of Jason, the uh, yes. the the kills, the the scares, the yeah. him being more human, wearing the sack and everything. It, it's just yeah. it's just different. Maybe well, some other day we'll talk it's, about. It's Friday funny too. because we all think of the <laughs> hockey mask, but I always thought it was scarier with the the, the toe sack because Definitely. I grew up with the uh, town that dreaded sundown, so you, right. I kind of that imagery sticks with you, and yes, you know. I remember seeing the trailer for part three and kind of being a little disappointed because it didn't look as as gritty. You know, it didn't look right. as uh, I don't want to say low budget, but it puts you more into it. And, of course, with the 3D stuff, I was like, oh, no, they're going to they're going to ruin this thing. But I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, still a fun movie. But yeah. and I'll say this as much as I prefer the part two look, uh, the sack had never there because to me it's scarier. Yeah. Uh, uh, the thing is. It wouldn't have been as dramatic moving forward in each movie. Right. 
to have that big reveal. You know, when the, the hockey mask right. comes off and all sure. the movies, it wouldn't yeah. be the same with somebody just like pulling off a sack. You know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe unless they, they fished for it once or something and reeled in. I don't know. <laughs> it just comes off his head out of a magic. <laughs> Right. A good a good wind catches it and just blows it off at the end or whatever. <laughs> Something. So I, I'll say that the drama of having the mask removed or chopped off or blown off or whatever it is in each of the the, the, the movies, it does add to it. But yeah, Jason's scarier with a sack on his head. Sure. Always will be to me. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. but that's not what we're here to talk about because True. we can go, we can go off on that <sighs> for sure. Your introduction to neighbors. Where did it start? Did did you see it in the theater or just at home? No. Not at the theater. Uh, I'm only nine when it comes out. And uh, this, uh, I can tell you this. The Blues Brothers was the first rated R movie that I was allowed to watch. My parents went to the theater. They loved it. It was coming to HBO whenever it came. And I remember distinctly that night when it came out and they said, okay, we're going to let you watch this movie. It's rated R. But they wanted to watch the movie in prime time and whatever it was, Friday night at 8 o'clock, whatever it is, you know. And I remember being so excited, you know. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to watch a rated R movie. So I watched the Blues Brothers, and I fall in love with it, yeah. you know? And because uh, oh, so the music and everything, yeah. and I bought their album, and I used to play with the Matchbox cars and have the cop be the cop from the Blues Brothers. And, and have I, instead of playing regular stuff, I was playing Dukes of Hazard cars, and I was playing Blues Brothers cars. And that's what I would play, <laughs> you know? So I'm right there with you, man. <laughs> you know? So huge fan of Blues Brothers. Okay, now, I, okay, this Belushi guy is awesome, this and that, whatever. So I'm, I'm loving these guys. Then this one comes out, and you know, then it comes to cable a couple years later. So whenever it landed on HBO, uh, yeah, is when I guess I watched it with my family, and it, it was one of those movies that we never thought it was weird. Nobody, yeah. my mother, father, my brother, and my we we never took it as oh boy, that's an oddball movie. It was one of those movies that we watched it and fell in love with the dialogue right away in in Earl Keese's reactions to everything, his facials, everything. It's just, (laughs) it it would, I guess we just all had that same sense of humor and, and that was it. So I just watched the hell out of it in the eighties, recorded it probably off HBO on on a videotape, watched it again and again and again with family. And I've always owned it in some capacity for a while. You couldn't get it. I had to get a a a bootleg, like a import DVD one that was like a multi-region Right. And then eventually it came to blue, and I go. But I've always had it, and it's always been a movie that's been discussed and and watched for years. You know, awesome. I'll even watch it by myself, which doesn't happen much, but it, it's a comfort movie for sure. Right. You know, and that's that HBO thing. It's that was the whole premise, really, of what Hell Ming was, was because these yeah. movies were on, I don't know, six, seven times a week, and for some <laughs> reason, every time you turned it on, it was on. So it just becomes a part of your routine. And you just you end up loving these movies. I I, I love uh, Metal Storm, uh, the destruction of Jared Sin or whatever the name of it was, <laughs> way more than I should because it was on twenty four seven on HBO. <laughs> right, that's what it was. They had what whatever they offered, we we had to take it, and it was repeating. Now I did that for a while, and then I started getting involved in in, in horror so deeply that I. Was able to get a VCR, a second VCR. I was able to find out how to record from one to the oh, other, yeah. and I was doing that. And then, from like probably 1984 on, it was a lot of horror movies, and it was a lot of me taping, renting and taping them with the dual decks, and just watching them so much that I didn't even really mess with HBO that much anymore, except for like right. the original shows, like whatever came on first and ten or. Uh, you know, later on to be like dream on or something. There was shows I would watch, but I was no longer, you know, in so, it's so weird to talk about it now in, in, yeah. in 2023. Like if I have my daughter here, I mean, she knows cause I talk about the past so much, but it's like to tell somebody that we had to watch what they gave us. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't have an option. Did you have? No, there was yeah. no. And it's just like when you rented a movie, you go to the, get a, get a VHS at the video store. You had to spend a long time picking that movie out. And that's half the fun. I'd be in the store for hours with my friends, right? And then you finally settle on a movie. Now you go home and watch the movie. If if, if 30 minutes into the movie, you think it stinks. Guess what, buddy? You're stuck with it. You're, you're still going to watch it. <laughs> this is it. You're, yeah, you still have to watch it. And hopefully, and luckily for horror, if the movie was bad, a lot of times back then, it ended up being so bad it's good. So right. it made for a memorable time. Like right. there's bad movies we saw then that we still reference now. So. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you are you are describing. It's weird. We we are we are exactly the same because I, I remember myself 
going and renting stuff and learning how to dupe them, right? <laughs> from from VCR to VCR, yes. and having your copy that you could wear out. But yeah, man, so much of the fun was going to the to the the, the store and going to the little mom and pop shop and staring at the 45 <laughs> tapes they had up there and just trying to figure out which which one do I get, right? And it's all based off that artwork, man. Yeah. All based on the artwork. And that's something I've been doing recently on Dr. Movies. I'm, I'm checking out all these that I passed on back in the day because of the art. Well, I mean, I, I was intrigued by the artwork, but I didn't check it out because, you know, there was not on Elm Street, you know. Right. And sure. some of them I'm finding out it's probably a good thing that I passed on them. <laughs> <laughs> but sure. it's that thing of you like, man, I always that artwork always got me. I always wanted to check that out. Now I'm checking it out. Right. So right. Th- that's kind of a fun thing there. Anyways, back back to this movie. We've talked about everything but the movie. I know. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, uh, great, I mean, the setup of this is John Belushi is your everyday midlife man. He's, he's, he's having – not necessarily a midlife crisis, but he's definitely heading that direction. His life is boring. He's in suburbia, and life has lost its, its, its luxury. I mean, it's just – it's just dead, right? And uh, you kind of brought it up on a go. The, the the music, he wasn't happy with the music. It, it's got this sad trombone stuff that plays all the time. Yes. Whenever it's him, like, reacting. It's, walk, walk, walk. it's like, what right. is going on? And, and you know, he, he's dealing with a wife that seems like she could care less. You know, life has gotten the better of both of them. They're just going through the motions. Right. And the new neighbors move in. In the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> they pull and he gets out of work, right? He comes home. He hasn't even taken off his work clothes yet. So and he's sitting there waiting for waffles to brown of all things. <laughs> Thought his wife was gonna make him something more. Uh, and it, it's waffles, and he's sitting there on the couch watching the news, chilling out. Never even bothered to go upstairs and get changed for you know any of that. He comes over and he's sitting down. So it's probably like you know maybe six, seven in the evening. Right. And he's just sitting there, and all of a sudden, <laughs> he hears the noise. Hey, okay. honey, there's people moving next door. <laughs> there's no kid stuff. Thank there's, God. Thank God. <laughs> it's great. I mean, you can tell life has just already chewed this guy up and spit him out. He's he's just going through the motions. Yeah. And you know, we'll get to what this all means, I guess, at the end of it. But, you know. The neighbors they get are not your normal neighbors by any means. Uh, he hears a knock at the door, and it's Ramona. And let's just face it, she's she's a sultry sex pot. I mean, <laughs> and about as manipulative as you can get, man. I mean, she's basically just throwing herself at him all the time, and he really doesn't know how to handle it. And that's what half the fun of this movie is, him reacting to her. Yep. Right? <laughs> Is, totally. Is, I mean, she's constantly either like he'll walk in the bedroom and she'll be in his bed naked just with a sheet on and she'll flash him, you know, and he's just like, oh, ah. <laughs> and then she says, what's the matter? She goes, yeah. are you afraid that Vic will think think you're up here chewing me, <laughs> chewing me? <laughs> what a line chewing me <laughs> oh she's so good i tell yeah, you they yeah. all the performances everybody in this movie yeah it puts on a great performance and right. that's one more thing about it but oh. yeah but uh he goes downstairs and we meet vic who's just sitting in his chair in the living room watching his tv <laughs> how are you neighbor <laughs> <laughs> he's like i'm sure i'm sure ramona's already told you my whole life story well she didn't even mention him we thought this is some single woman that moved in that store and she's making the moves on him yeah <laughs> it's great yeah i mean it just it's just a whirlwind and they decide well we we don't have enough to eat so hey how, how about we just you know i'll go get us some food you know mm-hmm. and you get that whole scenario where he's <laughs> makes him makes john belushi dish out the money for this meal and tells him, oh, there's this new place across town. And there's, you know, he's just making this crap up. Man. I mean, <laughs> and John Belushi knows it. That's what's hilarious about it. He absolutely knows there is no new place in town. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, and, uh, and come to find out. And then he even borrows his car. Right. <laughs> we'll get the stuff. And I love every time he gets in the car, you can hear him take off. 
I mean, <laughs> he just pedaled to the floor, driving off the driveway, out in the yard. I mean, <laughs> totally. I, I was cracking up today, uh, noticing, not maybe not for the first time, but this for whatever, this time just made me laugh a lot. The part when he takes off the next morning to go get the breakfast. When he comes out and he just cleaned the vehicle and all that, he goes, hey, I'm going to get yeah. his breakfast, you know? And so anyway, he takes off to go get breakfast and the way he takes off, he goes on the lawn and everything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He, he gets com- completely off the driveway and drives out across the yard around some post that's out there. Right. <laughs> and I, I looked again because I thought, does everybody do that? I wonder even if the tow truck did, but the tow truck didn't. I thought, man, it'd been perfect if they would have done the same thing. It right. just added a little more to it. This is all about driving John Belushi's character totally insane. And right. you, you, you there, there's parts where you think the wife is in on it. You know, John Belushi's wife is in with these two characters, and they're all pulling this prank on him. Like I said, every time Ramona gets him all hot and excited, and he goes upstairs and spruces up and comes back out, and it's like, surprise, we right. got food. <laughs> So, absolutely. They, that's the thing. They, she has to be in on it, and because the part later on, when he's in the bathroom and she locks the door and he yeah. can't get back in that way, and he has to go down the hall, and then he's still locked out from there. But Ramona is in the bedroom, yeah, with Enid, and the dog is in and there the dog's for in no there. reason. And he's yelling <laughs> about the dog, and, and and she makes a comment like, "You should." This is what Ramona says. And she's like, you should have stuck it through the mail slot when you had the chance, Earl. <laughs> so she is definitely telling Enid what right. she's doing to her husband. What's going she's on? She's saying, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm coming on to it. She has to be. And then on top of it, Enid is sharing things with her about her liaisons with this Native American fella. Right. And you can see hints of that throughout the movie. Yeah. So yep. it's like she's having something going on the side, and she's bored with her life the way John is. Right. But But she – She's and, reacting to it, and, and he's yes. still staying the path, you know. Right, and she's telling Ramona about it, this woman that she just she just met. So <laughs> she ends up being in on it. It's so funny because you're just like – but then the movie ends the way it ends, and you're like, huh. It's almost you're like, right. hey, this, this, and this. But they found out that even though they were playing with Earl, they enjoyed his company the most. Right. That's what right. it down to. Well, it, it you know gives him the shot in the arm of of reality again. It's we get so busy. I, I told this to my wife. I said, "Here's what the movie's about." I said, "We get so busy with life, we forget how to live." Right on. Well That's said. really what this movie is about. You know. Yeah. It's about we get trapped in what people tell us we have to do and this is the way you do it and this is life and be happy with what you get cuz that's that's it. That's all you're getting. And we go why is there not more? What, what if I go this path, right? And that's what this is. It, it's it's waking up and, and saying, I don't want to follow the system. I want to do what I want to do. Now, what the consequences are, you have to be okay with that. But that's really when this when this all wraps up and it takes these crazy lunatic people to move in next door, you know, to, to make Earl realize that, you know, this is living. Even though it's driving you insane, <laughs> this is living, right? You know? <laughs> and how many times do you have to sink in, in quicksand <laughs> to realize <laughs> you're already a dead man, right? Wow. You know, it, it, it takes you almost dying to realize that you've been dead all this time. That's very profound. Well, I mean, wow, look at this. So that that's good. And, and this was based on a book, too. So right. I wonder if the, you know, getting to that, if the, the writer – intends that then you have the whole it's kind of a punk rock attitude right where this is what we and the funny thing about this movie there's all these tie-ins with punk rock because yep. belushi in real life was really into punk rock at the time of the, by the mm-hmm. way if anyone is a fan of belushi i recommend you watch the documentary it's just called belushi right if you haven't seen i watched it for the first time just a few months ago and it's great but they were talking about when they were filming this he was very much into punk rock he was going through this big phase seeing bands everything else and he wanted the music in this movie to be punk rock it didn't end up happening luckily it didn't happen because the score by bill conti who also worked with the director on rocky and the karate kid movies and everything else is brilliant it adds another element to the film that I just think it, it's done so well. It's funny. There's no other movie that really has a, a soundtrack, a score this, like this. This soundtrack right? is bonkers because you go from 
you go from leave it to beaver sounding music to the sad <laughs> trombone to weird synthesizer scooby doo <laughs> saturday morning you know uh, twilight zone sounding yeah. stuff i mean it's it's the weirdest combination of stuff and it all has its place right based yeah. on what's going on and every time that you get in that situation that same theme is going to play again right <laughs> Yeah, it brings it back. Characters yeah. have their own themes. Situations, of course. There's even a horror movie theme at one point. point yeah. When he's looking in the basement, he's about to get locked in. I'm like, I feel like I'm watching a horror movie right now. It sounds like it too. So, it added so much to it. And Belushi wanted this punk rock in it. And ultimately, right. all they gave him was the one song, the one scene. It, it was uh, Dead Kennedys. It was Holiday yep. in Cambodia. Uh, really quickly, and then right. in his. Yeah. Yeah, in his daughter's bedroom, he had that she had the poster of the DOA movie, which was about to come out, which was a punk rock uh, documentary right. type thing, right? Yeah. So they gave him a little something, I guess, but ultimately he wanted punk rock. This, but the funny thing is this: what you said about it—that's a very punk rock attitude. Yes, uh, absolutely, right? It so yeah. it kind of ties in. It's like a couple things what you said about sinking in quicksand, and that. So yeah. this it, it makes a movie even more profound now to me. Sure. <laughs> I was like, wow. Isn't that well, something? That's what's funny about, you know, if if you don't watch it that often and you go back and revisit it, there's there's a lot of movies that impact you differently in whatever stage you are in your life. You know, I've always said, and I'm, I'm totally getting off subject again, but, you know, as a kid, The Exorcist was really scary because it was happening to a kid, and you related to that. As an adult, it's even scarier because it's about a parent that can't do something to protect their child. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's weird how that happens to you and and you know that's what i got out of this movie when i saw it before i was like wow it's just about you know, these crazy people moving next door and just driving this guy insane no they're bringing him back alive is what they're right. doing right <laughs> isn't that you know? wild wow it's, it makes you so want to cool. pick up your tv and throw it over in the corner and set your house on fire and say i'm out of here <laughs> i'm gonna go find out what's out there right, right? i'll tell you i'm watching a movie today and i legit am thinking i don't have a tattoo on me not one because I can never settle, and because everything, and so many reasons I haven't. But I'm watching this movie, and I said, you know what? And I do this from time to time, and I never follow up. But as I'm watching it, and I've been quoting it for years, when he goes, born to party, and he born does the party. thing on his arm, <laughs> right? I, legit, for a few minutes, I was sitting there saying, you know what? I'm going to get that damn tattoo. I'm going to get it. Very few people are going to know what it is, but right. I think I, I should get this tattoo. <laughs> Stay tuned. Talk to me next year and see if I ever did it. But Wow. <laughs> Being the fan that I am of the movie, I could get away with it too. I'm like, look at this, sure. <laughs> but yeah. no one's gonna know. You born to party, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. I like to party, so it it, it, it yeah. could still fit in. But it's a direct <laughs> reference to neighbors. But now, now you're making me think about being the age I am and everything else. And even though I still, uh, I still feel young and I still act it. And right. it, people like you and I still have that that fountain of youth mentality and it, it keeps us it keeps us cool i think you know what I mean? it keeps us from yeah. falling into a mode like 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 becoming an earl case yeah. well you know? we we found who we are and we've always and that's what i tell people you have to be comfortable with who you are i think the problem like you were we were talking earlier about social media and other stuff people are so busy trying to find who they are because they're not comfortable with who they are yeah but when you're i mean i'm the same person i was in high school i haven't changed a lick and I'm not going to because I like who I am, you know. Right on. Uh, it's it doesn't work for everybody. No, it rubs people the wrong way. I'm sure sometimes, but I'm comfortable with who I am, so I don't have to do things to try to improve me, except maybe lose some weight, things like that. Try to stay who in shape. Who doesn't do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, just like your back wall, your VHSs, my music stuff, my DVDs, and all that stuff, it's part of who you are. And yeah, you know. That that's uh that's the beauty of it, right? So I'm the same you way. I don't, have a, don't, don't have a single tattoo on me either. I've right. had a few. I was like, if I was gonna get one, it'd probably be this. But I like Many the born, I like the barn to party one, man. It's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it would be cool. It'd be <laughs> such a rare thing. I always would say for years. I used to say it would have been cool to get a tattoo of tattoo. And what I mean <laughs> from Fantasy Island. I said, oh, they play, they play. Yes, because it'd be. Uh, Maybe someone's done it by now, but I thought yeah. amazing if you're out someplace and you happen to see a guy look on his shoulder and he has a tattoo of freaking Hervey Villachez dressed right. up as tattoo. I'd be like, wow, that's that's a clever little thing right there. I, I like that. And, and it you know, brings up that conversation where you can go, hey, you want to see my tattoo? Yeah, see? Right. 
<laughs> totally. And here's the here's the part. How many people are going to know? It has to be people our age right. or older. Uh, you can't show it to you know anybody lower than Gen X. They're not going to like. What's that? Who, who's that guy? Is that is that uh is that what's the, is that mini me you have on your arm? What is yeah, that? You yeah, know? yeah. It's a generational <laughs> thing for sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so a scene in this movie that I knew it was coming. I, it's it's even in the trailer. I've seen it. It'll it tell you how many times. And I still laughed out loud when it happens. Is when Mona shoots that cue ball. Because <laughs> she's over there touching those glasses, right? He's like, don't touch those. I've been collecting those since I was nine years old. <laughs> sure enough, man. Bang! <laughs> Knocks the whole oh. shelf down. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, and you know it's coming. You right. know it's coming. Uh-huh. But I think it's the way... Because the ball hits him, I think, right? And he runs into the... <laughs> yeah, I think. I think he's just he trying reacts. to get out of the way of it. He he yeah. reacts. That's right. And he, But it, it, it kind of hits him, too, at the same time. <laughs> it's just great, man. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I remember I'm, seeing that in the commercial too. And yeah. she but actually she feels bad setup, about it because he's so serious, you know. He's like, yes. "Don't touch these." Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, set it down. And she's like, "Snippy." <laughs> she puts it on the wrong shelf. He's like, "Okay, this goes in this spot right here." You know what I mean? He's so anal about it. <laughs> and then it happens, and he's got tears in his eyes. I'm like, "Oh." But she does feel bad. I'll give her that. Yeah. She was messing with him, but she was like, she had a look on her face. You could tell she didn't, you know want to do something like that they're like messing with them and and uh, attempting to to play jokes and to, and to give them fake blackmail and, and fake accusations which which is all <laughs> probably my favorite moments of the film are from the time he sneaks out and sees him cooking uh the the, the food yeah. the spaghetti because oh, yeah. he takes the money yeah. decides he goes out and he cooks and drops it on the floor <laughs> he's listening to the doors <laughs> it's great combing his hair over the food so that whole scene from when he sees him there and then he sinks his truck because he thinks he's a liar, moves the brick. The guy's yeah. truck sinks. Yeah. Then comes back, sees Ramona, and she propositions him. And then they go inside, and they have the dinner. And to oh, me, <laughs> that, whole, that whole, like, 15, 20 minutes are the best moments of the film. I yeah. love it. And that yeah. dinner scene, that conversation. Yeah. I could see any time, if my father or brother were here, I could just go like this right now. Good, is it? And if I say good, is it? <laughs> They know what's next. I must call Caesars and compliment the chef. And the whole thing comes in. She says he tried to pork me. Right. This hip, get into this big fight. He leaves. <laughs> that dinner scene is brilliant. It, yeah. It's only second to uh, hereditary. You know what I mean? As far as sit down right. dinners and conversations. Right. <laughs> uh, completely different things. But just they're both classic to me. And that is, yeah. I love that conversation they have. It's yeah, done so man. well. And it just he's when when <laughs> what about the proposition? You know, he picks up the wine bottle. He's like, <laughs> and he goes, it's totally, totally not what he thinks it's gonna be either, right? Because he's like, all right, she's blackmailing me. She I, saw me. She saw me drown the car out there. She knows what's going on. He tried <laughs> to pork me. <laughs> what? Pork <laughs> you? <I'm> never. <laughs> well, I wasn't born with your hand in my bush. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And he's like ignoring it at first. He's like, so what's this? He goes, oh, isn't it time you you, you do some confessing early? Uh, Vic, uh, Vic just confessed, Earl, that, you know, he cooked the meal. Isn't it your turn? And he's like, oh. And he goes, what? And then he's like, yes, Ramona, I know. He pours the wine. I accept the figures you mentioned. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and they're figures. like, what are you talking about? You know, why would these two have anything going? They just met. What figures, Earl? What's going on here? And he yeah. thinks that she's going to come clean and say he sank Vic's truck. Instead, she's like, he tried to pork me. <laughs> pork me. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah, man. And <laughs> Could you again, imagine that? Messing with somebody like that for fun and then coming clean later? <laughs> so oh. talk let's talk about the whole power lines thing. <laughs> what's your what's your take on all that? Because that's the only thing I'm just kinda like. Is it because of her thinking that we're just taking, you know, ruined land sites and just putting people's houses on it and this is just part of the new norm which it kind of is now but it, yeah it's such a weird thing thrown in there right it is because even even the dog you know when baby comes out she's like you know <laughs> like a blowfish <laughs> yeah. and it's glowing you know it's, it's the dog in the movie and it comes out it's obviously got some radioactivity going on <laughs> right <laughs> oh it's but great you got these power lines that just run across the back they're always arcing and things are going on there's one scene where uh, John 
kicks a, a lawn chair and it just flies up in the air and it's like magnetic <laughs> magnetically charged and it hangs on one of the one of the right. beams. It's just crazy. It is crazy. You know, I think it is because they kind of make a statement about it when they're going for, when they're going to look for the truck because of it, it being in the swamp. And he says something about this used to be uh, yeah. yeah used to be a nice stream. It was clear water. Everything was great here. And then he said somebody uh, up town started Chemical dumping some chemicals. Yeah. yeah. And then weird things started to grow. So I think yeah. they're kind of making commentary on on just pollution and industrialism and things like that Yeah. in general because it kind of ties in with it. Okay, they got all these power lines, a grid across the world. And, you know, maybe they put them up too quick. We only have two houses here, and now they're dumping stuff over here, not not caring what's going to happen. There's things growing. There's a swamp here as a result. What are they doing to us here in this community? Because they right. even say it's not really it's not really city, and it's not really country. It's right. just kind of like yeah. – and, and there's only two houses on the street at the end of this cul-de-sac. It's like, it's like they don't care what's going on over there. Right, right. So I just that, – that's such an oddball thing, and yeah, it, it still kind of works, right? Yeah. You know, but but uh, of course, you know the the scene with the chair, and then <laughs> Vic is taking shots at him out in the yard. I right. mean, and then he tells him later on, "I knew it was you. Yeah. That's why I missed." Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. He has that old getup on. He has goggles. Yeah, and a, and like a diving suit because he, he said he was going to yeah. dive in the swamp and look for the yeah. truck. <laughs> That was great. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards, when they go in there and they had that coffee cup scene, when he's switching yep. the dirty oh, coffee man. cup. Off. Yeah. <laughs> I just, it's, to me, that's what it is. It's that type of comedy. Could you imagine being Earl Keese and being put into that situation where someone's right. giving you a dirty coffee cup? And how are you going to react? And like, I guess people complained at first because they said they didn't like how how docile he was and how when he kept getting confronted with all this harassment and how we, the way he took it in stride for so long and didn't, didn't like, you know, fight back so much. But honestly, I think that's more true to life. I think people are reluctant to avoid confrontation until they really get pushed to the limit. I think right. maybe people back in the days when you're watching a movie, you know, a piece of fiction, you're used to seeing everybody fight back all the time. But that that's not real life. Go outside right, right. now and try something. Right. It, it takes a lot to start a fight. Right. So I guess movie-going audiences, that's something else they weren't ready for. Why is Earl just kind of like right. accepting all this and not like saying, what the hell's the matter with you? Or so, You know what I mean? It took yeah. him a while to get there. But, you know. Well, we've had the transition since then with with falling down, right? There's, there's where the guy yeah. gets pushed over the edge and takes it the other direction. And that's kind of what we're used to. Whereas right. before, civilized, this is the way we handle things. This this is you know normal life, and keeping it all in, right? And that's that's what you're seeing here is a guy that finally does reach that point. It, it, <laughs> you know the edible panty scene, right? That was kind of a breaking point for him, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, he bunches them. <laughs> And maybe it was out of line to say those things, but sure, sure. That's the funny thing is I don't think that would really warrant a punch compared to other things that have happened. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean that's I get it. It's his daughter, so he's like, it's hey. The thing though that you've stacked all these things up, right? It's the it's the right. tolerance level has finally hit that point. Yes. All right, this is this is the, the this is as far as we go, right? You've taken my money, <laughs> you've taken my car. We're eating food that you that you just scraped up off your floor. Uh, you know, your wife is hitting on me, and then. Blaming me for something that I didn't do. I mean, and now my daughter she right. just shows up. She got kicked out of school. The cops are bringing her over here at freaking 10, 11 o'clock at night for some reason, right? Or whatever, whatever time it was. Maybe that might have been two in the morning, too. Because yeah. right after that comes in, he says it, two, two. Is and that what time it is? Yeah. <laughs> and you're standing here eating her edible panties. Yeah. Right. Perfect. You know, <laughs> and of course, cherry. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's just one thing after another. But the thing yep. is, this is the kind of movie that you're just going to – it seems to me like you're going to love it or you're not. Right. It, it, I don't think there's too many people that are going to watch the movie and say, eh, yeah, it's okay. I think it's the kind of movie where it's it, it, if you love it, you're, you're kind of passionate about it. And right. if you don't like it, it's just one of those things like it's just not for me. And I right. get it. Right. Sure. You know? Sure. And that's the that's the way I was with some of those other ones that we brought up earlier, kind of the cable guy. Some of those other right. movies is like I, I, I don't know where I sit on the fence on this one, right? Right. You have to kind of give it some time. Yeah, I think about uh, uh, Napoleon Dynamite and all those later humors like that, which don't really don't really click with me. But there's obviously right. something there that it does click for some people, right? True. So yep. yeah, again, that's that's why these movies are uh, if there's something some merit to them, they last 
for a long, long time. And uh, like I said, the cult following and stuff. But yeah, this one, this one is just a a rare bird, man. And and even though it seems like the characters you're used to seeing them switched, I think they came up with the right idea with you know letting them play the characters they did. So it just works out great. One hundred percent. I can't yeah. imagine anybody else being these two characters. And right. Right. Not them, not other people that they, they audition other people. There was rumors that Rodney Dangerfield was wanted to play the role of Earl Keese. I can never imagine Rodney wow. Dangerfield playing this style. No. no, I can't see him being that serious for that long. It just right. and just other people. And I know there was that's the funny thing. There was all kinds of problems with the casting, and yeah. then there was problems with uh, just Belushi. Like I said, Belushi didn't like the or Aykroyd. They had issues with the director Belushi more than anybody. But they both t- took umbrage with things, and and they wanted to rewrite certain things and other stuff. And then they at the, at one point wanted the uh, somebody called John Landis and asked them if if they would come <laughs> and direct the movie. And right. like, well, the movie's already started. I can't do that. And yeah. I think he was filming uh, American Werewolf by then anyway because they had already done Blues Brothers with him. But right. they're like. Could you come here and like no? And then they could go, and then I guess it was tossed around that Belushi or Ackroyd could have directed it. So I don't know what happened yeah. between Elvidson and them that could have been so bad. But man, I watched the movie and and I think it's comic genius. I, yeah. I I don't understand, but again, maybe they just didn't have the foresight at the time. To, well, again, it, it, it was different. It's just that that ahead of its time. I mean, that's that's what we keep saying. Yeah, Belushi and Ackroyd were onto something. That we weren't ready for yet. Even the director wasn't ready for yet. So, and plus, you know, they take some liberties from what I understand. The the guy that wrote the book was not happy with the changes they made to the story. But, uh, you know, I think as a movie going population, they like the movie ending and the things that happen there versus what happens in the book, too. So I think it's a lot darker in the book. I believe so. so yeah. I should read it. All this, I yeah. never have. I'm kind of curious about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I'll buy. Forget the tattoo. I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can spend ten bucks and, and, and you know and get a, a freaking a paperback shipped to me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I'm reading neighbors. Nice. <laughs> a- anything else you want to add on this one? I mean, we we've, we've talked about quite a bit. There, there's a lot more we could talk about. There's the airplane. So much. I mean, <laughs> with and, him in the seat, <laughs> the little Vic in the seat. <laughs> That's and he's out there flying it, and this is where when the <laughs> Mona's really making her moves, <laughs> and he's like, I, I, I can't concentrate. It's that damn plane. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. And then he comes over and he's coughing, and he doesn't believe it. And he's like, You guys are fawning all over a fake, a phony, and a fraud. And then <laughs> psh, all of a sudden, there's a fire. The, the house, house burns down. down. <laughs> and then you find out they're squatters. They they weren't right. buying the house. They weren't even going to live there. No insurance, no nothing. They just came and lived there because they knew that it was empty. And that's it. <laughs> oh, man. And they came and went so many times. After the dinner, he says, yeah. he goes, we're going to be living next to you guys for a long, long time. <laughs> and then a few hours later, Vic comes back after going to get breakfast, supposedly, comes back and tells Blue, she tells her old keys. I'm leaving, goes, yeah. Yeah, you don't get it, do you? I'm moving. And you can have Ramona. I'm like, what? What's going on here? Then they burn it down. Then they're going to leave again. Then they invite them to stay and that whole conversation. Oh, man. They're back and forth so many times in 24 hours. They they take off walking. Then he's like, my checkbook. And he goes and confronts them about the checkbook. <laughs> so, yeah, right to the end. Yeah. yeah. And then he feels bad about it. So he gives them the car and lets them take off. What a guy. <laughs> and then out of nowhere... You know, his wife, after all this, decides that she's going to go run off of this Indian guy who just comes and picks her up at her house now in a Jeep. (laughs) And she's dressed in full Indian regalia. I mean, it's just like, what is going on here? He's like, where'd that get up come from? (laughs) I've got reinstitutionalized. I got to go back to college. They they cleared my name. So you got that. And who does she write off with? The freaking guy. The the guy, the guy's son. Yeah, who just <laughs> literally picked him off off his feet a few hours ago and li- lifted him off his, but with his one hand lifted the guy off his feet. <laughs> oh and now his daughter's going off with him. How do they even know she was there? Although there is that funny part when the guy does show up, the other guy from Police Academy, Sweet Chuck. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I heard you got a whore in there. And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he's like, you don't got a whore in there. And he's like, of course not. He goes, well, if one shows up, you let me know. Right? <laughs> you want to show someone up when you let me know? <laughs> Just who thinks to write this into the movie? It's great. Yeah. It's such dialogue. Yeah. And, you know, I, uh, I've always been kind of passive on him because he's he's almost a 
a he's definitely a character you know player yeah. but he works perfect in this movie man he's definitely. he just nails it so <laughs> yeah just got the right a, attack right because it's almost like i know this guy right i've been to his shop <laughs> right i know totally yes yeah. very believable yeah yeah the so. look of the shop everything it's, it's authentic <laughs> as can be yeah totally and the guy's yeah. attitude and how about the phone call that they make oh, <laughs> when, he, when he's downstairs and he calls his friend and the guy on the other line knows that no one lives next door to Earl for some reason. He goes, it's Vic. He lives next door. No one lives next door to Earl. That's right. The guy said, so he's like, what the hell is going This poor guy's in bed in the middle of the night. <laughs> but his wife and the phone rings and all this craziness goes on. He's like, and don't ever call here again, don't Vic. Don't ever call her again. <laughs> oh, I'll tell brilliant. you. It's brilliant. <laughs> it is. There's so much dialogue in this movie. Just like a Flash Gordon where you yep. could sit and just talk lines from the movie and nobody realizes it. Except the the few people that are passionate about it, but there's just so many lines. Like you said, maybe like a Napoleon Dynamite right. or uh, maybe like a, a Big Lebowski or things like oh, that. Yeah, people talk yeah, about absolutely. the cool things. And I'm like, I enjoyed those movies. Don't get me wrong. But to me, it, it, I don't know. I just seem to, for me personally, the dialogue here just seems it's right. like on another level. And I'm surprised but, more people aren't into it. Yeah. You know? well, and, but, and again, that's, that's why we want to talk about this, because if you do like those kind of movies – you don't need to overlook this one. I mean, because I think personally, I think this is the precursor to all that style of humor. And I don't know that you can beat this one really when it comes to this style. I, I think this one just really delivers. And like I said, way ahead of its time. And like I said, I think it would be appreciated much, much more if it came out in a different decade. Yeah. It just, nobody was ready for it. And that's, that's really where I stand on this. And again, there is a lot of meaning to this movie about <laughs> our day to day, right? I mean, it, as funny as it is and, and as crazy as it is, life is short. You better live it, you know? Yes. Well said. Yeah. Yes. So cool. Yeah. Uh, I always do a rating on these things. I think it's pretty obvious. I do a one through five. Five is obviously the top. What you give it, man? Oh, a five, of course. It's, it's been a five since the first time I saw it, and right. it's one of my very favorites, and I'll never get tired of it. So I yeah, don't give I, a lot of fives, but it's a five for me as well, man. Nice. I've always liked wow. this movie. Always liked it. I've seen I've seen it maybe twenty times. I don't think I've done a oh, nice. hundred, but I've seen it quite a few times. And so again, as soon as you brought it up, I smiled because I was awesome. like, wow, because this is definitely something that a lot of people don't know about. Or a lot of people know about, they just never seen it, right? Sure. And this this is that thing that really makes me want to talk about movies because these are these gems that you want to lead people to go and, and see. So perfect choice, man. Perfect awesome. Choice. Yeah. I was just – thank you. I was just happy. I had a feeling maybe you'd like it. I'm like, okay, it, it, it's from 1981. It's Belushi yeah. Aykroyd. It's off the wall. Ricky does like some off the wall type things, uh, in you know the whole Flash Gordon thing, and I like that with, with the lines and there's so much so much dialogue here. Maybe this is going to be in his wheelhouse. So I was oh, like, yeah. okay, hopefully. I didn't know that you were that much into it, but now, oh, yeah. like, wow, that's wow, awesome. But like I said, it, it's one of those that's it's one of those memorable theater experiences because it was so different, you know. Like and that. again, this is you know my mom and dad split when I was very young, so my dad would get me on weekends, and our thing was. Just go check out a movie. Right so we went, we went and watched a lot of stuff, which probably led to me watching a lot of stuff I probably shouldn't have watched. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, this is one of those that I just distinctly remember watching in the theater and walking out and going, wow, that was really different. And like I said, my dad was like, I don't know what I think about it, you know. So, you know, it it it, it was working its magic back then. And I need to see if he'll watch it again and see what he thinks about it now. Oh, think, do it. I think he would enjoy it now. So do it while you can. Anything with yeah. our parents, do it sure. while you can. You know what I mean? Right. A hundred percent. I mean, my old man's 85 now. You wow. know, God bless him. He's still mm -hmm. kicking it. He's, uh, you know what I'm saying? My my mother's about to be 75. So I'm very, I've been very fortunate that way. But it's like neighbors, like even tomorrow when my father comes here in the morning, just because I have it on the thing, when he's here having coffee, just kicking it. I'll, I'll put it on for 20, 30 minutes and we'll have laughs. And like, well, I'll set a time aside where me and him and my brother will, will sit down and do it. We watched Flash like last year because I got the 4K. That's when we had to watch. There's like certain movies. There's like half a dozen movies 
that we've watched so many times since then, and that's one. But like you said, with, with your father, you got to yeah. do it, man, sure. because tomorrow's not promised. You got to right. enjoy. It's like life, like you said, you got to live your life. And some of the fun in in living life is sharing a, a great movie with somebody. Absolutely. You yep. know, so. Yep. Do it, man. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think you're tap you're tapping into exactly why the movies and stuff like this are so important because it's not only just watching the movie but it's creating those memories of who you saw it with you know who you share it with yeah. that interaction like you know we're talking about rocky while i go my, my daughter i have a grandson named rocky because my daughter wow. is such a big rocky fan and it all wow. started with us sitting down she was probably 12 years old i said hey the first rocky movie was coming up. i said you know watch rocky movie. She's like, i just don't see how that's going to be any good you know, I just don't get it. I don't see how a box movie. And again, twelve year old girl. Yeah. Yeah. When the movie was ending and the credits were rolling, she said, "You want to watch the second one?" <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And then one one day, two or three years later, not that long, she came through the house one day. Me and my wife were having a conversation about something. She, my daughter, said, "Rocky Four is the greatest movie ever made." <laughs> <laughs> I looked at my wife and I said, "My job here is done." <laughs> That's awesome, man. <laughs> so, I mean, it's even so to cool. the point where she named her son Rocky. I mean, that's – Oh. And that's all because of that relationship and growing up and sharing movies together. And, you know, that's what these movies are for us. All that collection you got down there is all putting you in a time and a place that you still cherish so much. And yeah. – to share those opportunities with other people. It just, that's what makes it all worthwhile, man. People think of it as wasting time, but you're really building memories. You just don't even know it. Right on a hundred percent. It's not yeah. wasting time. If, if it makes you happy, right. then how is it wasting anything? E even yeah. money. People could say, people could say, Hey, well, what do you do with your money? And you know what? As long as my bills are paid, I mean, nobody can say anything right. about me. You're not, yeah. you know what I mean? I, yeah. I'm, I have a house. I do my thing, whatever, but it's like, when I was collecting these VHS tapes, I had to go to these places uh, to get them. And I mean online, like to, to VHS like, uh, collectors and stuff like that. Yeah. And it turns out when they found out what I was doing with them, they got angry at me mm -hmm. because I just used them for display purposes. I wanted yeah. the shelf to look – I wanted to, to be a replicant of uh, mid to late 80s when I went into my video store – and the yeah. movies that I would see on the shelf are the movies that I wanted to have. Alphabetical, just like it was. My favorite ones, that the covers are, even if the movies weren't good, uh, they were just memorable covers for me. So I wanted them. So I collected them, and then I, I even ordered the things, the, the blank VHS um, cases. So I I'll put the cases behind it because, you know, when the movie was rented out, right. there would be no case. So right. most of my movies have a case behind it, so it's as authentic as it gets. So right. now – People see this, and I put a video out on YouTube, and, and I talk to them about it. And when I tell them that I'm not watching these movies, that I'm not buying them to play in a, in, in a VHS player and watch it for whatever reason, they they would get angry at get me. Upset. They would say, like, I'm wasting my money. Why are you doing this? You're not even watching the movies. What's the matter with you? And I'm like, well, this is what makes me happy. So just yeah. why, why are you messing with me? I'm not, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not taking the movies and smashing them or, or, and, right. and saying, hey, I, you, your hobby sucks here. I'm going to rip out the tape. I'm not, doing, I'm not antagonizing them. I'm doing something that makes me happy that right. I want to share with other people that maybe it'll make them happy. And right. Why not? Oh, trust, trust me. I'm already like, man, I wish I could do that. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> it's a fun hobby. It takes sure, time. Sure. You know, the thing is, I, I got lucky, buddy. I got the shelves because awesome. and I hate to say this. I was upset that that family video, the last chain in the country shut its doors but something good did come out of it because right. all the ones around here they were giving away all these shelves i just had to go wow. and get them so I got, I got four shelves in the house and <laughs> then i was able to buy some cheap movies too because they were getting lower and lower in price so i mean again i wasn't happy about it it's a right. bygone era it's sad to see them go but at least some good came out of it and i can celebrate it forever now it's down right. here right yeah I, I think it's great man i really do because it it is such a a piece of who we are man the the, right. the whole vhs boom there's not another time like it i mean i i like the way things are now as far as just access right but it was a magical time because this is the only way you knew what was out there this was not the stuff the majority of this was stuff that you you would never see in a theater <laughs> right right and so you know to walk in and and see these movies and just taking a chance on it 
there's just not another time like it. And uh, yeah, yeah. Again, it 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 puts you in a specific time and place, and uh, that's just where I live, man. It's where I live. <laughs> you and me both, brother. It's the greatest. Why not? You know what right. I mean? It, it makes us happy. It gives us a. It keeps us in that, that that right frame of mind, that mentality. That you know, once you let go of that, you're done. That's what right. happens. You become like Roque at the beginning of the movie. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? And I'm not letting that happen to me. I'll, yeah. I'll we're, die we're first. Supposed, <laughs> supposed to supposed to grow up and and nah. not have hobbies and just sit in our chair and be a man. <laughs> you know. Right. So. Never gonna happen. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. It's not gonna happen. I, I'm. I may have grown up. All I am is is more responsible, and only because I have to be, not because I necessarily want to be. <laughs> so, but I, I mean, I'm responsible. I go, I, I go to work, I pay my bills. What do you want from me? I help. My, I'm a good father. I try to be. That's it. Hold so on. I'm sitting here, and we're doing this podcast, and I'm actually sitting at my drum set, which ah. is a zebra skin drum set. So if that doesn't say you need to grow up, I don't know what it does. <laughs> right? Ah, I love it, man. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> no, I mean, again, it's who you are. Right. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm sitting here. I've got a spinal tap, Evil Dead, Army of Darkness, and a six million dollar man lunchbox over my head. <laughs> wow, I love it. Oh, that's you know? great. And you man. know, it's who you are. It's who you are, and never be ashamed of that. And and again, if if you take one thing away from this episode is when you know this movie is all about living your life. Nobody else can live it for you. You got to find what makes you happy because you ain't got along. Amen. Yes, sir. Truer yep. words are never spoken. Yeah, <laughs> it goes by fast. Have fun. That's what that's what we're here for. Have fun, man. Uh, do absolutely. what you do. You well, know? man, it, we're getting close to. We've been running a little over an hour. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah. Let everybody know. I mean, everybody knows exploding heads, right? But go ahead and give us a rundown, Maybe. kind of what's going on with the guys, what y'all got going on, where they can find you, all that good stuff. Cool, man. Thanks. Yeah, uh, exploding heads. Right now, all our newer episodes are on are on our Patreon page. And there's three episodes a month. And the cool thing about that is we always have a free trial. It's a free trial for 30 days. You come in and and there you go. You can get access to everything. So and at the most that people pay, they pay three bucks a month and they get three shows. However, they don't stay on Patreon exclusive forever. We also release them to, to everybody else after somewhere between like eight and 12 months. They'll come out and they'll be on you know, iTunes and Spotify yeah. and YouTube. So if you don't, if you, if you don't, if you're not on the Patreon getting the brand new ones with the video and everything, they will eventually be at those places. It's exploding heads, horror movie podcast. And there's, we just had episode 200, which was the wow. top 200 horror movies of all time, which we had people vote on and everything else. And we had to compile this big list and a lot. It was a three episode thing. It was like maybe 20 hours worth of, worth of stuff for one episode. So we, we went hard into that. And now we took, we took a little tiny hiatus and we're coming back in a few weeks, but there's exploding heads. And then I'm on the, uh, the other show with, uh, geez, there's, there's nine of us on that show. Jay, the dead's new horror movies. Wow. And, that is a big one with uh, – there's so many different things, though. Everybody has their own segment. We mostly talk new horror movies, as the title would indicate, but we also sometimes talk about a um, a retro film that, get, that gets drawn out. And uh, But we're on top of things there. There's lots of stuff, and you can find Jay the Dead's horror movies yep. uh, at the same places as everything else. And um, Watsy Party Horror Show? comes out sporadically now and again it's me and mr watson and mr watson is also one of the per people one of the hosts on jay the dead's uh you know new horror this jay the dead it's uh I'm, I'm always afraid i'm gonna i'm gonna leave somebody else so i don't mention all the uh all the people <laughs> but but uh <laughs> greg amortis doc shock dr walking dead kill man joel uh macula ron i hope i didn't miss anybody watson <laughs> myself and jay i think that's nine I was wondering about that because I, I I thought that that Watson was on that show as well, and I was like, oh, so if y'all just kind of not doing as much with the with, with the solo show that y'all had or what? So, well, Watson doesn't have to do the work now. Uh, <laughs> Watson doesn't have to do the re the recording and the editing and all that stuff. Jay does it, so it's uh, like okay, it's a lot of work for Watson to do it because he's you know you know how it is a production. And absolutely. That, yeah, that can kill you, man. That's that's right. what ended up, you know, making me kind of burn out because yeah, I wanted all the bells and whistles, right? I wanted to do all the crazy, over the top stuff, and yep. I've learned that with what I'm doing now, this is about as simple as you're gonna get. 
And right that's just working for me. And and I'm cranking out pretty much an episode every day all through the work week. So, you know, I'm, I'm catching up with you. I've got 105 in the in the in the in the pocket already done. Wow. So already yeah. of this yeah. one. Holy yeah. cow. <laughs> See, but that's that's you, Ricky. Though I always I always say Ricky's the kind of guy who he when he podcasts, it's all or nothing. Like yeah. he he'll do a whole bunch at once. He'll record maybe I don't know how many days a week, but I'll see a bunch of shows coming out in a short time. Like every every few days, he has a show coming out, and he'll do it, do it. He'll go real hard, and then he'll stop. It explodes, yeah. And he'll go away for like three, four, five months and not yeah. do anything. And then he'll come back and do it again. <laughs> so you're, you're one extreme or the other. You either yeah. have to go all the way in yeah. deep or you can't do it. And yeah. Hey, at least That's you true. know it. And at least you take your breaks, which yeah. is cool. Cause yeah. you got to pull away from it. You can't let it consume you. You don't want it to, you want to live your life, you know? Right. And, and the so. good thing about what I'm doing is I'm doing it while I'm driving to work. So <sighs> It's time that's just being utilized that I'm just sitting in a car. So that's what makes the Dr. Movie thing work so easily. And I basically True. just record it, send it out there, it's done. And, you know, I'm, I'm starting to do these things here when I'm having a guest. I'm going to try to do maybe one a week, maybe every other two weeks, something like that, just to kind of get this thing going. Because you miss that collaboration stuff, you know. Yeah, man. But, uh, but yeah, that that's what works for me. But y'all need to not worry about Dr. Movie. You need to check out Exploding Heads. Uh, you can find their Facebook page. They let me sh show all my crappy stuff on their page, so that's nice of them. <laughs> of course, I love your stuff. Keep doing uh, it, man. You know. But man, Keep doing I, it. I I got a feeling that we're gonna do this again. I'm just yeah, saying. I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah, I, so I do too. It we'll took start so talking, long. We'll start talking about the whatever comes up next, and and uh, maybe we'll get something else in the books here pretty soon. <laughs> you could you could count on it, I think. I hope the listeners like awesome. it and you know they can tell we're having a good time here. Oh yeah, so, no doubt, man. Because we got to stop ourselves from talking. Really, <laughs> <laughs> really we do. You know, uh, <laughs> man, I sure appreciate you coming on, man. This has been great. I appreciate you having me, brother. It's it's <laughs> like you said, it's been a long time coming. I knew we would have a great time, and yeah. I'm, I'm it's unfortunate we waited this long, but here we are. You know, so yeah. More to come. Stay tuned, right? Absolutely, folks. Y'all just hang tight. And if you like this, then I'm, I'm sure we're going to have another one down the pike for too long. So uh, just hang in there. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. If you got any comments, questions, concerns, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> feel free to let me know. We'll figure out what we can do next. All right, folks, that's it for us. Adios, people. Peace.